At the end of the second season of Buffy, the show's popularity increased intensely. People really connected to the well-written characters and storylines that were enjoyable to both casual and hardcore viewers alike. Because of this, a few things were updated at the start of Season 3, including a new logo, which would go on to be the main logo used for the show from this point forward. It's a hell of a lot better than the last one, which I believe was supposed to be based off of Buffy's handwriting, but it's just not as appealing as the stake through the B Classic logo introduced here. The theme song was also re-recorded, so it no longer sounds like it was recorded in a basement with almost little to no production done on it. There's an added organ part at the beginning, and it just sounds much more crisper overall. With season 3, many more recognisable writers for the show will begin popping up around hit episodes. Seth Green was also added to the opening credits, making Oz a main character, and the only added main character, similar to how Angel was added to season 2's credits, despite Angel being a prominent character in season 1. To be honest, I always saw this season as my favourite, but will looking at it from a more critical standpoint change my mind significantly? Well, let's find out, as this is an episodic analysis of season 3 of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We open on a vampire rising from his grave with what we presume to be Buffy standing over it, ready to take him out. Except it's Willow. The rest of the gang have been taken over from Buffy since her departure a few months earlier, with Oz, Andrew and Willow struggling to stake all the vampires and Giles following very obscure and trustworthy leads to find Buffy. Meanwhile Buffy is still in Los Angeles, currently waitressing at a diner under a new identity and where she runs into Lily. Lily was last seen under the name Sean Terrell as part of the vampire worshipping cult that Ford was part of in Lie to Me. Her boyfriend Ricky is missing and she pleads with Buffy to help her. Buffy just wants to be left alone after killing Angel at the end of the previous season. She's hit by a car attempting to save a very out of it elderly man and after running away from the crowd she bumps into Ken, who's handing out leaflets for a teen shelter. He attempts to get her to join them but she declines. Back in Sunnydale, school resumes and Cordelia returns from her holiday abroad. One of the greatest long shots of the show happens here, lasting a phenomenal 3 minutes and 24 seconds. The chaos of the school buzzing with excitement and conversations. It's all about egg whites. If we can focus, keep discipline, and not have quite as many mysterious deaths, Sunnydale is gonna rule! All building up to Xander and Cordelia reuniting, which lasts the shortest of all the conversations, and they awkwardly walk away. Smash cut to Buffy sitting alone in complete silence, showing her complete solitude and loneliness. Very nice contrast, not gonna notice there, Joss Whedon. Xander hatches a plan to have Cordelia act as bait for the vampires, which doesn't work, but it does let the relationship pick back up again due to the action. Lily returns to Buffy and she reluctantly follows her to the blood bank where there's been no sign of Ricky. Buffy later finds the old man she saved on the street earlier, only for it to be Ricky? He suddenly drastically aged about 70 years and has died after drinking some drain cleaner. Lily doesn't take this news very well and bumps into Ken, who convinces her to come to the teen shelter where Ricky apparently is. Buffy, now intrigued, returns to the blood bank where she finds out that Ricky was considered a candidate for something by the Doctor. The Doctor, speaking of the devil, is interrogated by Buffy and reveals that she's paid by the teen shelter to pick candidates for something, but she's not exactly sure what. Buffy goes to investigate and arrives just as Lily is about to be sucked into a pool of god knows what. Buffy and Ken follow for it to be revealed that it's actually a teleport or transport or to a different dimension, and Ken reveals himself to actually be a demon. This isn't surprising, it's one of Whedon's most disappointing twists, but at least things get interesting as humans are actually brought there to act as slaves for decades before being spewed back into the earth, where time moves much slower and only a day has passed, explaining why Ricky was missing for a few hours and was suddenly an old man. Buffy causes havoc and releases the slaves. This is the price of rebellion! <laughs> Oh, Ken doesn't die from that, but instead gets trapped under a gate where Buffy bashes his head in. This kind of action and life-saving adventure convinces Buffy to return home. She offers her job, apartment and identity as Anne to Lily, and she returns home to Joyce where the episode ends. Now I like this episode, it's entertaining. Seeing a side character like Lily return to have a bigger role is interesting, but she's quite annoying. And Buffy, who's clearly rusty when it comes to dealing with people during her slaying adventures, doesn't hide the fact that she too finds Lily annoying. The final fight scene where Buffy just keeps taking out the demons that get thrown at her is thrilling. The show could clearly afford better stunt coordinators and the budget to make the stunts come to life. There's an interesting scene where Giles goes to see Joyce after returning from a dead end lead and she actively blames Giles for Buffy's disappearance. Giles is hurt by this, as he feels he's done all he can to try and get Buffy back. But it's her duties as a slayer that led her onto Angel's path and resulted in her killing him to save the world. Speaking of which, Angel still appears in the opening credits for this episode, which is interesting. He does appear, but only briefly, in Buffy's romantic dream scene on the beach, but it's clear that there's more to his disappearance. And with the established time factor in alternate dimensions, 
anything could be happening to him for any number of years. Willow and Oz have a strong relationship going, which has lasted through all summer. Meanwhile, Xander and Cordelia haven't seen one another in a while, and it never looks like a stable relationship. They should be elated to see each other after the summer apart, but they aren't. They only reconcile when Xander saves Cordelia from the vampire later in the episode, which may show her true affection for only one side of Xander rather than him in his entirety. I like that Buffy only returns to Sunnydale in the last scene rather than starting the season with everyone adjusting to her return. You know, we see what life is like for her in Los Angeles and how she gets her groove back. It was always going to be hard for the writers to have Buffy readjust into Sunnydale after the long summer away, but with the right person behind the story, it could work. It doesn't work. Well, actually, let me go into more detail. We resume later in the day since Buffy returned, it now being evening. She leaves her mother at home to find the rest of the gang, which she does and reunites with them, everything seemingly normal. However, when Buffy arranges to meet with Willow, she doesn't show up. Buffy returns home to meet Pat, one of Joyce's friends, who she met at her book club during Buffy's absence. Joyce invites the gang over to their house for a sort of sensual dinner where they can try and reconnect. Buffy is sent to get the plates from the basement where she finds a dead cat that obviously wandered in before dying. They bury it, however, because of one of Joyce's new pieces that she brought back from her job at the museum, a Nigerian mask which resurrects the dead, the cat is brought back from beyond the grave. Giles takes the cat to the library to study how it was raised, and the rest of the gang decide that a party... Hootenanny. Oh, my bad. A hootenanny would be more appropriate instead of a dinner. Needless to say, the party... Hootenanny. Right. Anyway, it doesn't go too well, and Buffy is sort of ghosted by Willow and Xander. Giles doesn't even show up because of research, and when Buffy hears Joyce saying something negative about her presence out of context, Buffy starts to pack her bags again. Willow finds her, and the two finally start to reconnect, but Joyce arrives and makes the situation hostile. It moves downstairs where Xander starts to get involved and really winds up Buffy. I just... This is wrong! Not only for Buffy to act so dumb and expect everything to go back to normal, but overhearing things out of context and jump to conclusions? It just doesn't sound like the character I've gotten to know over the past two seasons, who is efficient and always acts for the sake of others, understanding her roles as a slayer. Willow, too, acts like a complete asshole. First of all, why does she not turn up to meet Buffy? This isn't explained, and it seems out of character that she wouldn't go out of her way to cheer up her best friend, who's clearly going through a tough time. Throughout the argument with Buffy, she keeps making it about herself. As if her problems should be considered by Buffy, despite the fact Buffy killed her lover, which no one would understand how that feels. But even when Willow says she wants to understand, Buffy denies her. Buffy, she's doing what you wanted her to, why are you turning her down? Xander stirs her up, Oz is just silent, which leaves Cordelia to defend Buffy. Cordelia should not be the only one defending Buffy in the situation. That's not right either, and why does Buffy shut her down? The mask raises some dead people from around Sunnydale and they eventually crowd the house, which causes the gang to spring into action. Like nothing happened, they just started working together like old times. Why have all that conflict if you're just going to wipe it clean? Is this what the characters would do? This episode is throwing me through such a loop that I feel like I don't know anymore. Through the very serious and tense argument scene, we keep cutting to Giles figuring out that it's the mask in Joyce's room that's raising the zombies and attempting to reach the house, constantly being stopped, which is presented in a very comedic way. Oh. It's so inconsistent. Giles is very funny here, and it's some of Anthony Head's greatest performed comedic lines on the show, but would Giles really put research into why a cat raised from the dead, over sparing a few hours to reconnect with Buffy at her house, party or not? No, he wouldn't. Surely they can't mess up the action scenes, though. What, what even, what even happened? Why were there so many cuts to nothing before something happened? That was the biggest mess of cinematography I've ever seen. There was no need for that. Early on in the attack, Pat is captured by one of the zombies. Later when the gang go upstairs, they just find her lying there. Why is she upstairs? How is she upstairs? Did the zombie take her up there? If so, why? They carry her through, I presume she's alive. I'm sure she even makes noises, but by the time they lie her down, she's dead. A zombie tries to break through the door, but not only is the Slayer keeping it at bay, so are three other people. There's no way it can get through fucking god damn. Basically, if one of the zombies put on the mask, they become a super zombie demon or something. It's really only explained in one line by Giles. Zombie Pat puts on the mask and cue a really dated and unnecessary overly computer-generated transformation. Really showing off that new fancy budget they have, but it kind of comes off not aging as well as if they had just did it practical and flashed a few lights or something. Buffy fights the zombie demon Pat and kills it. The gang reconnects and it's all happy. What a clusterfuck. 
If there's one thing I can give it, it's that the first half of the episode is fine. There are no issues I have with the first half. Good dialogue, good acting, all that jazz. It's the second half that makes this sort of notorious among fans. I actually didn't mind this one before, I thought it was completely fine, but it's not until I'm looking at it from the perspective of the overall story that it's just... unnecessary. I'm fine with the characters arguing and having conflict if it's done right, but here it just seems like they fight because... the episode needs more conflict. This is the instance of when a character or characters do something out of character for the sake of the story. It's one of the worst ways to further a story and I can't stand it. Here though the characters act out of character so that they can be put back into character by the end. Ugh, there was no need to take them out of character in the first place. The second to last scene where Giles threatens Snyder to allow Buffy back into the school is a great scene. It's stuck right on the end and it's just to fool you that anything actually developed for the story in this episode. When Buffy and Joyce first meet with Snyder, why wasn't Joyce the one to threaten him the way Giles did it? As a biological parent, it would make more sense. That would make the whole episode's conflict completely unnecessary. And they could focus on the more interesting and sadly plausible plotline of the zombies. There are remnants of a good episode here, but it's written all wrong. Martin Oxen, I hope your next contribution to the season is heaps better. Oh, it's a David Greenwald episode. Where's my funny monster? Where is he? There he is. Basically, as Buffy finally begins to transition back into high school, a few new characters begin to pop up as is the title of the episode. Faith is the Slayer. I mean, the new Slayer, who was called after Kendra died. She comes to Sunnydale since her watcher is at a retreat to meet Buffy, who seems to be making a name for herself if people in Boston are even hearing about her. Faith is definitely a fan favourite character, I see her mentioned in people's best character list all the time. Her first appearance here is funny. She brings a more adult edge to the show, despite being slightly younger than the main cast. At least, according to a one-off line by Buffy, she's younger in anyway. Hope is Scott Hope, who is attempting to become Buffy's new romantic interest. He has a few awkward interactions with her, failing to get her to dance with him at the bronze shortly before the gang meet Faith. Ironically, Scott Hope is completely hopeless. He's just not a great character and the weakest of the three introduced here. The final is Trick, Mr. Trick at that. He's a vampire that's accompanying Kokistos into Sunnydale, who's the funny monster. Kokistos is angry at the Slayer, presumably Buffy, and wishes to kill her. Big surprise. Trick is instantly charismatic. He's portrayed well by the veteran television actor K. Todd Freeman, and I love this character. I mean, admittedly, it's not a haven for the brothers, you know, strictly the Caucasian persuasion here in the Dale. Is that Grimoire perhaps cleverly poking fun at Whedon's overabundance of white characters in the show? Yeah, I know that some people don't like when politics get involved, but I like that line. It's Greenwald's way of saying he's very aware of what Whedon's characters all have in common. Giles is working on a spell to bind a Cathla, ensuring he can't rise again. Buffy avoids telling him the truth about how Angel's soul was restored not once, but twice during the episode. Mr. Chicken Kikistas gets situated in an abandoned building somewhere in the town during the day, ordering a pizza just so they can eat the pizza man instead. It's quite funny. Here we find out that Kikistas has travelled to Sunnydale to kill Faith, not Buffy. He reveals the nasty scar that Faith clearly left, and it's got him a bit pissed off. Faith and Buffy have an altercation while patrolling. Faith refuses to help a cornered Buffy, instead overdoing a beatdown on a vampire, leaving Buffy to have to fend for herself, which she luckily does. Faith and Buffy have very contrasting ways to dealing with slaying. Obviously we've seen this before with Buffy and Kendra, but the difference there was that Kendra was a slayer who took her calling more seriously than Buffy. Faith is a slayer who takes her calling far less seriously than Buffy. Instead of Buffy having to see eye to eye with a more serious slayer, it's now the complete opposite. During a meeting with Giles, they agree to get in contact with Faith's Watcher at the retreat, which, by the way, Giles wasn't invited to, for some reason. They theorise that since Kakistas and Faith arrived in Sunnydale are in the same town, there may be a link. Buffy runs into Scott, who asks her out, and Buffy decides it's time to move on, and accepts. He hands her a gift that has the same ring in it that Angel gave her in surprise, funny coincidence there, and Buffy freaks out. Giles makes sure Buffy's alright, but also informs her that the green Walt twist for this episode is Faith's Watcher is dead. This may not be the most obvious green Walt twist, but the more I rewatch and listen to the dialogue, the more the idea is sort of fed to the viewer a bit too much for this to be a thrilling surprise. Faith was clearly unstable and seemed on edge while fighting vampires. You know, something was up, and in the scene earlier, they mention a possible link between Kakistas and Faith. It's not rocket science, but it's far from basic arithmetic level to put that one together. Buffy confronts Faith and she starts to lose her cool, revealing that it was indeed Kakistas who killed her watcher, just as Kakistas shows up with Trick and the rest of the gang of nameless vampires. They fight, Kakistas dies, letting Faith finally avenge the death of her watcher, 
and Mr. Trick gets away to live another night. The Watcher's Council agrees to let Faith stay under Giles' supervision until a new Watcher can be sent. Buffy finally decides to tell the truth to Giles and Willow about what happened with Angel's soul, probably pushed by seeing what Faith went through and the strange short-lived relationship she had with her Watcher. Putting that in comparison with Giles, who has grown to genuinely care about Buffy, it's no surprise she feels like she can trust him enough to come clean. When Buffy leaves, however, Giles reveals that the spell didn't exist and that he only wanted to see if Buffy actively wanted to be truthful with him, rather than keeping it all to herself. I guess it's an act of support to show her that he's there for her when needed. Buffy makes up with Scott and they agree to date, and Buffy says goodbye to Angel properly, leaving the ring Angel gave her at the spot where he died. <laughs> uh, why is it Why is it still going? Why is it getting bright again? Oh Jesus, that's Angel and I... Oh God, I can't show that. Uh, gee. Yeah, Angel comes back from hell. Why and how we don't know, but uh, what an ending to leave us on. The scene where Joyce and Buffy meet with Principal Snyder to arrange Buffy's return to the school is a good place to talk about the theory I mentioned in my Season 2 video. Does Snyder know that Buffy is the Slayer? I think so. He's aware of the Hellmouth, and it's plausible that his constant getting at Buffy and pushing her to leave school is his way of telling her to focus more on saving the world rather than her studies. However, he calls the mayor with the good news after she's expelled. He wants her gone because the mayor is clearly planning something that a slayer is going to want to stop. A possible apocalyptic situation? We'll find out later. I know I give David Greenwald a lot of stick, but it's all in good fun. He's a damn good writer. I have a bit formulaic at times with how he structures his stories. This episode is well written, well paced, a genuine blast. There's been a murder. On one of Oz's werewolf nights, Xander nods off and someone gets mauled. They begin to feel the worst in that Oz has somehow escaped during an open window during the night. Meanwhile, Buffy is preparing to go see the school psychologist, Mr. Platt, as a condition of her returning to education at Sunnydale High. She's very vague with him, but he pushes Buffy to begin to be more honest and open with him and her issues. Meanwhile, she runs into Angel, who, despite the fact that he's a rabid beast, found the time to put trousers on since last episode. She chains him inside the mansion, where she finds the spot he came back in. She attempts to soothe him, but it's completely hopeless. Angel's been in a hell dimension for god knows how long for him. Possibly hundreds of years. It's going to take time for him to come to his senses after that. Willow conducts an experiment on hair found on the corpse, which she managed to get by sneaking into the morgue, as you do. The results came back inconclusive for Oz, and Buffy worries that Angel might be responsible. Scott has introduced Buffy to his friends, Debbie and Pete, who are also a couple. She has a few odd words with him before leaving to speak to Mr. Platt again, and as she begins to open up, finally admitting that she needs help, he's dead. Oh, why'd you kill him off? How great would it have been to have a school psychiatrist that Buffy has to keep being honest to without giving away the fact she's a slayer for the whole season? Even if he just stayed around for a little longer at least, he was cool. He got one scene and I already liked him, which I guess shows how good Marty Noxon is becoming now over whatever the hell she was thinking when she wrote Dead Man's Party. Seriously, the character least deserving of a death this soon in the show, my vote goes for Mr. Platt. Since he was killed during the day, that eliminates Oz, and Buffy can eliminate Angel, who still hasn't informed anyone is back. She does have a hypothetical conversation with Giles about it, but it only makes her more on edge about the whole thing. It's actually Pete who's the culprit for the murders. He was afraid Debbie was going to leave him, so he made a potion to turn him into a far less attractive organism, hoping it would convince her or make her feel threatened enough to stay with him. Oz finds her with a black eye and Pete watches on. Oz turns the gang onto the idea of Pete being involved somehow and Buffy and Willow head to talk to Debbie, who defends Pete for hitting her and... Oh, is... Is this a domestic violence episode? Really? Are we doing it here? Now? Okay, odd choice, but okay, I guess. Um, uh, Pete, meanwhile, has a bone to pick with Oz, who turns into a werewolf mid-fight and nearly kills Pete. They attempt to tranquilize Oz, but Debbie is quick to point the gun elsewhere and Giles takes one of the greatest tumbles in television history. Right, bloody priceless. Faith and go after Roz and manage to tranquilize him successfully this time while Pete kills Debbie. Buffy finds Pete and nearly loses to him, however Angel shows up after breaking free from his chains earlier and twists Pete's neck. Oh Angel, how you love to snap necks. He seems to be beginning to return to normal as he recognizes Buffy and says her name. She still keeps it a secret though from everyone else, and as she consoles Scott he mentions how you never really know people even if you think you do. This is not only signifying the fact that he has no idea that Buffy is the Slayer, but that Buffy is also keeping a big secret from the gang about Angel's return. I think Marty Noxon may have been a bit weary about whether the story of simply Angel's return could be enough to hold up the episode. She adds in the whole domestic violence thing, which I'm pleased the show tackled, but I'm disappointed that it did it in a way that makes it come second to Angel's return, or even third to the fear of Oz escaping. 
The throwaway characters being the ones to tell that important story is questionable, but doable. They just don't get enough screen time for me to care as much as if it was characters that were established. The show would take another crack at it again much later and do an incredibly better job of it in my opinion, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Oz's werewolf design is different now, spotting the design the production staff affectionately called the gay possum, which is a joke that is aged like fine wine, can I just say. Honestly, I don't have a preference on what kind of werewolf design I like more. You can call it a retcon, but we will see the old design again much, much later. I like to imagine that the full moons have different effects on the transformation at different points of the year. Someone can probably debunk that with the canonical times the werewolf scenes take place, but excuse me for trying to find the glass half full on this very late design change. It was most likely to allow the suit wearer to have more movement. In the big suit, the werewolf looked more lifelike, but it couldn't really move an awful lot or jump around. The new werewolf design can leap along the floor like an actual mammal, much better for the action scenes. All in all, not too bad of an episode, just a little bit of confusing combination of messages in here. The premise for this episode is pitting Buffy and Cordelia against each other, competing to be this year's homecoming queen. Cordelia wants to do it for her own Cordelia ways, however Buffy is pushed when Scott Hope breaks up with her. Well, that thrilling romance lasted two episodes, I'm sure it was worth spending the money on the actor's wages. Scott's overall contribution to the story is to show how loyal Buffy is to Angel, even though Angel is a rabid beast who shortly before she had to kill him, became evil and killed her watcher's girlfriend. She still loves him, and hasn't gone over that. Buffy's being watched by two German gentlemen, with a setup linked to Mr. Trick. Meanwhile, we cut to the mayor's office, where a terrifying man enters it, where we finally meet the villain we've had teased since the latter half of season two. My dear mother said, cleanliness is next to godliness, and I believed her. She never caught a cold. <laughs> Mayor Richard Wilkins III, a seemingly polite man obsessed with having good morals and clean hands. However, the scared shitless deputy mayor tells of a different side to the mayor we're yet to see. He informs the mayor of the German, who are actually international terrorists. They're taking part in Slayer Fest 98, a competition organised by Mr. Trick to give competitors a chance to kill both Slayers for a wealthy fee. The competitors include the two German terrorists we saw earlier, along with an older gentleman on their team who operates behind a computer. A hunter named Frawley, who is very similar to Kane from Season 2, which makes me think they originally wanted Kane to return but decided against it. A little Gorch, who returns from the episode Bad Eggs in which his brother was killed, along with his new wife Candy and... Uh, Whatever the hell you are, my brother, you got spiny looking head things. I ain't never seen that before. I am Kulak of the Mequat clan. Isn't that nice? Huh? Xander and Willow are trying on some potential homecoming outfits before things begin to get romantic. Wait, oh, no, they're not doing this now, are they? They don't do anything in fear of being disloyal to the partners, which is half decent of them, I guess. If you want me to believe there's still some residual feelings for Xander on Willow's part, I can get behind that being plausible, but for Xander, who put Willow down and rejected her on so many occasions, time after time saying it wasn't how he wanted them to be, for him to now be in a happy relationship and suddenly 180 and decide against that isn't plausible. Let's hope it goes away and never comes back again. Willow was over Xander and is now with Oz, who, I mean, we went through this arc over the first half of season two and established it wasn't going to work. Due to the hostility and competition between Buffy and Cordelia for Homecoming Queen, the rest of the gang make them take the limo ride together to duke it out before reaching the dance. Little do they know, the limo is being driven by one of the German terrorists. He takes him into the middle of the woods on the outskirts of Sunnydale, and the two agreed by video of Mr. Trick explaining the rules of Slayerfest. See, Faith and Buffy were supposed to be the first two picked up, but because of the gang's decision, it was Cordelia first, then Buffy. Faith is happily at the dance, along with a mopey Xander and Willow. Wallace performs, and Giles attempts to lighten the mood. We have to find Buffy. Something terrible's happened. Kitty. I thought I'd give you a scare. Those finger sandwiches. Faith embarrasses Scott in front of his new date that he took instead of Buffy about him having an STD. God, I just feel sorry for him. That's horrible. And that's his last appearance. There he goes. Thanks for that, Faith. Cordelia, thinking she's going to die, admits to Buffy that she's in love with Xander and that they actually connect here. It's the first time the two have ever sympathised or attempted to understand each other before, which is nice to see. They eventually fight their way out of the forest where the spiky looking demon gets killed and flee to Giles' office where the Gorgias have already arrived and knocked out poor Giles, who seems to have had that happen to him at least once every episode. Candy is dusted by a spatula and Lyle is taunted away by Cordelia, who Lyle still thinks is actually the Slayer and he flees again. However, this time he doesn't come back and we never see him again. The German terrorists have been tracking the two via their corsages and arrive at the school. Buffy very cleverly puts a tracker on one of the terrorists so that they fire right and kill each other leaving the poor old man at the desk to believe he's won the game. Meanwhile, Mr. Trick is captured and taken to see the mayor, where they agree to team up. 
Back at the dance, Buffy and Cordelia arrive just in time for the winner to be announced to our winners, as it's a tie. Yes, Buffy and Cordelia both win the cup on a split decision and learn to respect each other as both friends and colleagues in the fight against evil. <laughs> nah, just kidding, the other two engines won it, leaving Buffy and Cordelia to walk off ending the episode. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Where's my Grimwalt twist? Where's my funny monster? Does the spiky guy count? I guess not he wasn't the final villain. Well, well, well. David Greenwald, you have proven me wrong. Congratulations. This is his final rating credit for Buffy, although he would direct one more episode and remain a consulting producer on the remaining four seasons of the show, while he worked mainly on the spin-off Angel from this point on. But we're getting ahead of ourselves yet again. I'm glad there was a sense of character development for not just Buffy and Cordelia, but the writer himself. I look forward to revisiting his future contributions to Angel when we get to it, but for now, this is a perfectly fine exit episode for the writer. Besides, I think it's about time we hear from a new writer about now, don't you? Jane Espenson is a very familiar name to a lot of Buffy fans. She would remain as a writer on the show for the duration of its run, eventually becoming an executive producer for season 7. She's known for writing episodes that seamlessly blend the incredibly serious and the ridiculously silly, and this is a perfect example of such a thing. The school band needs money for some new uniforms and Snyder enlists the gang to sell chocolate bars to raise the needed money. Meanwhile, the mayor wants to pay tribute to a demon he's in cahoots with and needs Mr. Truck's help. He apparently knows a guy. Buffy sells most of her chocolate to Joyce and Giles, who she also lies to in order to go see Angel, who's busy doing some topless yoga. Any excuse to get Angel topless on screen? Now, you know, why doesn't he just take his trousers off too while he's at it? I'm sure David Boreanaz wouldn't mind doing that at all. Buffy has a bad case of... lying. And she also doesn't inform Angel about her breakup with Scott. Buffy gets caught out of one of her lies at least when she arrives home to find both Joyce and Giles pretty peeved at her deception. Buffy complains that she never has time to do anything for herself, either studying, sleeping, or sleeping. Joyce and Giles actually listen, and when Giles doesn't turn up for work one day, she finds both of them in Giles' house, where they pretend like they're working on a schedule for Buffy, but they're actually getting drunk and listening to Cream. Yeah, it turns out, Ethan Rain is the guy that Mr. Trick enlisted, and the chocolate being given to the adults reverts them back to their teenage years, so that the tribute can be made to the demon without any suspicion going towards the mayor, because they're too busy partying and acting immature. The guy's suspicions are raised when they go to the bronze and find that everyone there is significantly older than the usual crowd. Buffy and... Snyder head to the factory where the chocolate is being made because Snyder knows about it considering he's in with the mayor. There they find Giles and Joyce who have been painting the town red, shoplifting, taunting cops who are also under the chocolate's influence, and getting up to other... adult things. They confront Ethan Rayner because he's such a wimp he tells them about the tribute and Mr. Trick's involvement. The rest of the gang are at the library and find out that the demon Larconis eats babies. Yep, that's the tribute. Giles remembers something from his watcher training about Larconis and that he's underground. They rescue the babies, kill Larconis, and Mr. Trick flees. I'll just ignore the fact that finding the location in the sewer was nearly impossible considering it runs all over town. But anyway. The mayor lets Mr. Trick off this time but threatens him very politely to never do it again. First off, we get a proper look at what Giles was like as Ripper. Obviously we've seen him look at it retroactively in the Dark Age, but we see the ladies' man first hand, captivating Joyce so much it makes things awkward when they return to their usual selves. It allows Anthony Head to use his natural English accent rather than the posh one he puts on for the character, and a bunch of quotable lines make him a joy to watch here. It's very much hinted that they do sleep together during this time, and it will later be confirmed in the season. For now, they just avoid each other for the next few episodes. Buffy and the Mayor meet for the first time, if you can call this a meeting. Hi! Yeah, we'll have to wait for it to happen legitimately. Also, Faith disappears for this episode. We can assume she's out there in the midst of the chaos doing whatever, or maybe, maybe she's asleep. Also, might have plot nitpick, but how do they make the chocolate do what it does? We see the factory where it's packaged, but not how Ethan develops it in the labs or ever hear about the logic and science behind it. Oh, actually, is it magic? I bet it's magic. Not a bad start for a new writer. Let's hear from another one, shall we? Douglas Petrie's story is almost exactly the same as Jane Espenson's. He's a story editor for season 3 and 4, eventually working his way up to executive producer by the final season. Just as a forewarning, by the way, if you were confused so far as to why I cited this as my favourite season, when all I've done most of the time is moan about this and that, we're about to hit one of the greatest strings of episodes the show ever had. And, while there are story elements I'm not a fan of, trust me, there are certain story elements I'm really not a fan of, I can't deny the quality of these individual stories. Faith's new watcher arrives, Gwendolyn Post, who immediately begins to get on Giles' nerves. She warns of a demon named Lagos, who's seeking an apocalyptic weapon named the Glove of Mind Gone. Buffy then, in turn, tells Angel, who gives her a sort of worried look. Back at the library, Giles is making Xandra and Willow work faster than usual, most likely as a way to get one over on Gwendolyn. Xandra and Willow are distracted due to... kissing each other. See, despite the fact they both knew it was wrong and that they shouldn't be doing it, and one of the biggest character developments of the previous season was Willow getting over Xander, they now suddenly love each other to the point where they can't keep their hands off one another. 
Giles catches the two but decides to act like he didn't, and Xander quickly leaves to the crypt where the glove is, now that Giles has uncovered his location in order to warn Faith or Buffy if they stop by. Well, neither Buffy or Faith is there, but Angel certainly is as he decided to find the glove himself after Buffy told him earlier. Xander tails up to the mansion where he finds Buffy and Angel involved in a passionate kiss. Meanwhile, Giles is at his place with Gwendolyn reading up about the glove in Tobin's spirit guide and... Wait, where have I heard that name before? I could look for the name Zool in the usual literature. Spades catalogue. Tobin's spirit guide. Yeah. Ah, oh, nice reference there, prop department. Xander informs him about Angel the next day the gang confront Buffy and have an argument. See, this is a reason for the gang to argue. And not just because the episode needed conflict, I mean this has been built up over the past few episodes, and Buffy herself isn't even sure why she kept Angel's return a secret, despite the fact she swears she never meant harm to the group at all. Giles splits the argument off and sends the gang to their classes, however Buffy goes to thank him and the facade drops. This is one of my favourite scenes of the show and it's hardly ever talked about in the grand scheme of things. It's the first time that Giles has never agreed with Buffy, even slightly. Although he was a bit miffed about her leaving at the end of last season, it was understandable to a certain extent why she wanted to be left alone to him. But this is lies and deceit. Something that she's been doing a lot recently, like in Bad Candy, he has to remind Buffy that Angelus tortured him for hours. Not only that, Remain the audience. I mean, Giles was physically and psychologically tortured and manipulated by Angelus, and the fact that Buffy knew that and still decided to harbor Angel, who, despite the fact he is a different character compared to Angelus, is still the same man or vampire. You have no respect for me or the job I perform. Buffy and Willow make up, Willow forgives her mostly because she's holding her own secret and believes she's just as bad. However, she can't confess this as a Largo's attack seeking the glove and Buffy kills him. Back at the library, Giles tells Gwendolyn about where the glove is located and that it's safe. She hits him over the head, revealing herself to be this episode's villain. To be honest, on a first time watch, I didn't see it coming. Maybe I'm an idiot, but they never made her out to be bad, just mildly snooty of Giles ways as a watcher. Faith meets Xander at the bronze and he updates Faith on Angel's return and the two agree to head after him. They stop by the library for weapons where they find Giles with some blunt force trauma and he's sent to the hospital. Are all those knockouts over the years coming back to haunt you now, Giles? Faith goes after Angel but Gwendolyn has already made it and knocks him out. After Angel just believes her that Giles sent her, I mean, does Angel already know that the gang knows or did he assume Buffy told him without consulting him about it? Either way, this is one of Angel's dumbest moments. Angel gets up and attacks Gwendolyn. Faith arrives and attacks Angel. Buffy arrives and attacks Faith. Xander will arrive and Xander terribly attempts to stop the Slayer's brawl. Meanwhile, Gwendolyn puts the glove on and begins using the weapon to summon lightning that she can point in any particular direction and fire. She narrowly misses Willow thanks to Angel and Buffy cuts her arm off with some glass, causing Gwendolyn to get hit by the supernatural lightning and combust into nothing. The next day, Oz and Cordelia are hearing of the tales of the battle, while Jill's informs him that Gwendolyn was actually fired from the Watcher's Council a few years earlier due to absence of dark magics. Yep, we've still got to wait a little while before we meet Faith's actual Watcher. In the final scene, Buffy and Faith disagree over what happened, and Faith decides to go it alone, saying that the only person she trusts now is herself. Where the fuck did this come from? Faith was only doing what her Watcher told her to, no need to start making enemies where there never were before. The fight sequence in the mansion is great, the stunt choreography is well done, and I applaud it. It's a thrilling climax to the episode, and now that the secret of Angel's return is back, things may begin to shift back to normality, but l let's be realistic. Angel tortured Giles, killed Jenny, and ran rampant at Sunnydale for half a season. Also, Giles seems to be growing more and more isolated from the Watcher's Council. Not only did he believe that the Council never would have memoed him over Gwendolyn's arrival, but he wasn't invited to the retreat in Faith Open Trick either. What is going on there exactly? The return of Spike, given to the new writer Dan Weber. He's most known for being a writer on The Simpsons in Futurama, but he did a season on Buffy writing two episodes, and this is the first, and oh god, where do I begin? First and foremost, the main plot with Spike is pretty good, and very humorous. It's the B plot that's a train wreck, and it's what's been building up over the past few episodes too. Let me start from the beginning. Spike returns to Sunny Dale MS after Drusilla had broken up with him following his truce with Buffy and departure at the end of season 2. She believed Spike had gone soft and decided to kick him to the curb. Willow and Xander are still groveling about how much they love each other and are trying to keep it a secret. In a vain attempt to return their relationships to normal, they organise a double date. Giles is leaving for a retreat which isn't Watcher's Council related. To be honest, that's not explained very well. Is he packing to retreat on his own? Are other people going to be there? Anyway, he warns Buffy about getting close to Angel again, but she brushes him off. Buffy does visit Angel and she asks him about whether or not she should stay in Sunnydale to go to college now that there are two Slayers, you know, she doesn't have to worry about her duties all the time and can travel. Angel recommends she does. 
Willow hatches a terrible idea to try and concoct a de-lusting spell on both herself and Xander, but Spike catches her in the act and kidnaps both of them, locking them in the factory so that Willow can do a love spell on Drew so she'll take him back. The mayor is practicing his golf game when his deputy suggests getting Mr. Trick to send a committee to deal with the problem, and the mayor agrees. Cordelia and Oz alert Buffy when Xander and Willow don't show up to a double date. Meanwhile, Spike heads to Buffy's house where Willow has left an important spell book that apparently has the love spell in it. Spike ends up confiding in Joyce peacefully, but Angel shows up and misreads the situation entirely, causing Joyce to freak out. Buffy arrives, invites Angel in, and they take Spike to the magic shop for the rest of the supplies needed for the love spell. Oz smells Willow's fear in the air thanks to some residual werewolf abilities and the two track down Willow and Xander just as they're having a make-out session. Cordelia responds by running up the stairs which collapse and impales herself on a pipe. Buffy, Angel and Spike fight off some lackeys which Mr Trick has sent, I guess they couldn't get the actor that week, and Spike decides that he's better off without involving magic and things and that Buffy and Angel's dysfunctional relationship helped him see that. I'm going to do what I should have done in the first place. I'll find her, wherever she is, tie her up, Torture her till she likes me again. Cordelia survives the impalement and kindly tells Xander to fuck off. Meanwhile, Willow and Oz are at a similar level of not speaking. Christ, how do Buffy and Angel have the strongest relationship right now when they're literally designed to not work? If it hasn't been made plainly obvious to you right now, I hate this arc. The episode is fine aside from that, but the only point for all this to happen is so that Cordelia and Xander can break up. That's the only reason. What's the need to involve Willow and Oz into it? There's a character that comes along later in the season who Cordelia has a little thing with. Why not wait until he shows up and break them up then? We're not even halfway through the season and Cordelia has no ties to the gang anymore, but she's got to stick around for some reason, so she does. There are plenty of other ways to do this, and poor Oz can't catch a fucking break, it seems he's been shot, turned into a werewolf, and now Willow decides that Xander, who has never ever reciprocated feelings back, who she moved on from in season 2, you know, that entirely focused on act that I keep bringing up that we've just forgotten about here, really, what was the point of this? Trust me, it was necessary for the overall story to break Xander and Cordelia up, but making them act out of character to further the story is really stretching it, especially after Deadman's party. If I could talk about the positives of this episode now, Spike is momentarily back and it brings me joy in this poor blip of writing. He dominates every scene he's in and almost steals the show completely, which is probably why everyone forgets about the whole Xander Willow thing happening. From his speech about the negatives of love to Buffy and Angel in the magic shop, to pouring alcohol on his birds and then proceeding to drink from said alcohol bottle immediately after, he is brilliant, and I'm glad he returned. Of course we have a little scene with the mayor to remind the audience that he's the big bad and we need to keep an eye on him, and, and can I say, the mayor is a delight. You can tell he's unhinged and out of his mind, but he still likes things to be clean and tidy and for people to mind their manners. He's incredibly likeable and hopefully we'll see more of him soon because we're nearing halfway and some first time viewers might not be entirely convinced of his villain potential. Now that we've got that out of the way, prepare for one of my most unpopular opinions about the show. I never liked The Wish. On my first watch I saw it as harmless fun, on my second I just wanted the actual story to continue, on my third I skipped it. The whole plot of the episode is that Cordelia befriends a vengeance demon named Anya, who is working undercover as a student so that she can grant Cordelia a wish that could potentially ruin her own or others' lives. Cordelia wishes Buffy never came to Sunnydale as she believes that's when everything started going downhill, and Anya grants the wish and the duration of the episode is spent in an alternate universe. Basically, since Buffy wasn't around to stop the master from rising, he's still alive, and Willow and Xander are his right-hand vamps. Angel is locked in the basement of the Bronze Club where the Master never resides and he's tortured by Willow from time to time. Giles leads a group called the White Hats alongside Oz, Larry and whoever the fuck that is. Her name's Nancy and we never see her outside of the Wishverse, so odd choice but okay. The Master is planning to open a plant that produces blood, I really don't get that either. Cordelia is completely confused at what's going on, oh hello Boom Mike, and mentions Buffy to Xander which puts the Master on edge since it's the Slayer's name. Xander and Willow travel to the library and kill Cordelia in front of Giles, and apparently Nancy dies off screen too as Oz and Larry return and take Cordelia's body out of the room. Giles spots something around her neck that he recognises and later identifies as a Nyanka's necklace. Giles believes that Cordelia made a wish to the Vengeance Demon, resulting in the world being the way it is. He contacts Buffy's Watcher, who sends Buffy over to Sunnydale. In this universe, she's much more serious and war torn, preferring to do things on her own rather than in a group. She rescues Angel and they fail to stop the Master. As this is going on, Jill summons Anyanka and destroys her necklace, turning Anyanka into a human being and reverting everything back to normal. So I know what you're thinking. Filler. I am afraid this isn't the case, as this episode does serve actual purposes to the story, so that excuse doesn't work this time, internet. If you expected me to rip on this episode, you'd be sorely mistaken. I'm actually going to like it more after this rewatch. It is 
almost entirely pointless, but it introduces Anya on a solid way. Obviously she is a far cry from the character we come to know, but her first appearance here is quite menacing for a monster of the week. On an unrelated note, the effect of the vampire dusting has changed from this episode onwards as it now shows the skeleton dissolving too rather than just a cloud of dust. The first half of this episode actually takes place in the real universe, but nothing happens here. You'd expect there to be a big fallout after Xandru and Willow's kiss, but no. Cordelia avoids Xander and Oz attempts to avoid Willow. That's it. That's all that happens here. No mayor, no Mr. Trick, no funny, aside from this line. You're taking an awful lot on faith here, Jeeves. Giles. It's alright. I don't hate it by any means and it serves a purpose. You know, this is one I've unexpectedly changed my mind about for the better. What a unique surprise for the series so far. The mid-season finale, which is odd considering we're only 10 episodes in and not 11, which means we're technically not mid-season but I digress. Over the Christmas week, Angel is haunted by people he's killed in the past as Angelus. He initially tries to walk her off running into Buffy, who- What the hell have they done to her hair? Fire the haircut department, Jesus Christ. Oz and Willow make up as Oz admits he can't live without Willow. Heh <laughs> uh, Well, Buffy invites Faith over for Christmas, who's now completely lost her Boston accent, by the way, that was quick, but she declines. Angel goes to see Giles out of desperation to understand why he keeps seeing Jenny and other people he's killed. However, he freaks out when Jenny appears right next to Giles, who can't seem to see or feel her at all. Buffy has a dream that night that she catches Angelus trying to snack on a maid at a party. Buffy believes this to be Angel's dream and that she was somehow in it. The gang round up in study books to find any sort of reason why Angel was brought back from the Hell Dimension and what exactly is torturing him. While Jenny convinces Angel to kill Buffy, Giles discovers that the creature tormenting Angel is the first evil. That's right. Evil itself. Incarnate. It's unkillable, but the Harpingers of Death, or Bringers for short, are what summoned it and killing them may stop it for the time being. Buffy and Xander get the location out of Willie the Snitch, returning from What's My Lane, although not really the location, just that the first is underground somewhere. Well, Buffy managed to find the Mayor's Tribute no problem, so I doubt there'll be any issue with that. Willow tries to make things up with Oz by inviting him to a romantic scene, however, Oz decides that he'd rather wait and go any further with Willow until he's ready, with which he concurs. Faith does show up at Buffy's for Christmas, and as Buffy goes up to her room, Angel's already there, and the first tempts him to have sex with Buffy so that he'll lose his soul again. He resolves this dilemma by jumping out the window. The first tells Angel that as long as he's alive, he'll never stop hurting Buffy, so he decides to kill himself, waiting for the sun to rise. Buffy, after doing some more research, finds the location of the bringers and kills them. Before the first disappears, it threatens Buffy and tells her that one day it will rise and end humanity. It also warns Buffy that Angel's planning to kill himself, and she rushes to the mansion where there's no sign of him at all. Only mere minutes from when the sun's about to rise, she finds him on a cliffside where the two break down and eventually admit their love for each other, despite all that's happened. Buffy can't seem to convince Angel to get inside, but that doesn't matter as it suddenly begins to snow. Despite the fact it's never snowed in Sunnydale before, and it wasn't even forecast. Joss Whedon has stated before that it could have been the work of the powers that be, a force that was established by Whistler in the season 2 finale. It's clear that they wish to steer the world in the best direction possible, and having Angel alive is important to not only stopping the first, but saving the world altogether. As the characters all watch the snow fall, Buffy and Angel walk down the streets full of obviously fake snow hand in hand, as their future together is looking hopeful. Very good episode, and one I recommend everyone revisit if you shrugged it off before. The main focus is Buffy and Angel, but Willow and Oz develop their relationship back towards normality, although there is not a hope in hell for Xander and Cordelia. That shit is over. Done and dusted. Buffy and Angel seen on the cliffside is a bit overdramatic, I think. It's acted well, believe me, but it comes off as a bit corny too. That's probably just me, but oh well. The first makes its first appearance, which yes, it will return, but long after most first-time viewers will have forgotten about it completely. This thing doesn't come back until the final season. That's nearly four full seasons until it's even brought up again. I'll talk more about why I think this is in my season 5 video when I get to it six years from now, most likely. A classic episode of the show following the town's sudden interest in magic once two young children are found dead with ties to a mystical cult behind the murder. Joyce begins an organisation named the Mother as Opposed to the Occult, or Moo for short. The episode begins to spiral out of control when Willow and Amy are behind it while the two dead children are actually talking to Joyce and are telling her to order police inspections on the school. Willow's intentions weren't murderous as it was actually a protection spell for Buffy's birthday. Through research, the gang finds out that it's actually Hansel and Gretel. You know, from the fairy tale. They've been dying repeatedly from town to town every 50 years, descending it into chaos, most notably causing the Salem Witch Trials. Speaking of chaos, Willow and Amy are kidnapped by their own parents in order to stand trial. Buffy and Giles are chloroformed by the Walmart brand chloroform, apparently, and Buffy is trialed too. Amy turns herself into a rat to escape, meanwhile Cordelia wakes up Giles, and the two stop the trial before Willow and Buffy are burned. Because of a revealing spell, Hansel and Grell transform into what the fuck is that? Buffy manages to stab it through the neck with a massive stake as Xander and Oz fall through the vents of the city hall in a vain attempt to rescue Buffy and Willow. 
None of the parents seem to remember much about what happened and everything has returned to normal. This has got to be, in my opinion, one of the funniest episodes of the show ever. Every second line of dialogue or action is hilarious and I found myself chortling the whole 42 minute runtime. Thania St. John was never an official part of the writing team of Buffy so she must have been friends with Jane Espenson and the two came up with the story which Espenson adapted into a full script. It's the only appearance of Willow's mother who's just as absent from her daughter's life as Willow made out she was. Cordelia is reluctantly brought back into things after taking a short absence since The Wish. Amy the Witch is now Amy the Rat, literally rather than figuratively, although <laughs> give it time. At least to do something with her character here, I'm glad they didn't bring her in for no reason. I will admit, not a lot happens here in the grand scheme of things. The mayor makes a brief appearance pretending to care about the kids' deaths, but that's about it. I like it because it's standalone, and I like it because it's so far-fetched and ridiculous. Only Jane Espenson could pull off an episode of season one as this, and make it fit in effortlessly with the show's current climate. On the Slayer's 18th birthday, their watch was to drain them of their powers without the Slayer's knowledge, using a muscle relaxant drug so that they may be thrown into dangerous battle and have to use their brains to survive rather than brute strength. Quentin Travers, the head of the Watcher's Council, arrives in Sunnydale to help set up the challenge while Giles handles the drugging part. Buffy starts to worry when her powers disappear and Giles eventually comes clean, feeling guilty and disagreeing with the purpose of the Council's challenge. Buffy is hurt and storms back home. Meanwhile, the vampire she's set to face, Zachary, is clearly unhinged. He escapes from his prison in the Sunnydale Arms and abandoned hotel and after failing to capture Buffy earlier in the episode, steals her jacket, which must have her address run on the label because he shows up at Buffy's home and kidnaps Joyce, leaving a disturbing yet hilarious selfie behind. Buffy heads to the Sunnydale Arms and takes on Zachary as Giles is told by Travers that Buffy has entered the field to play, despite the fact that Giles has already told her about the challenge. Giles heads off, but by the time he gets there, Buffy has slipped holy water in Zachary's drink, and as he swallows down his pills, it burns him alive from the inside. Buffy saves Joyce and passes the challenge. However, Travers fires Giles from the Watcher's Council. Why? Your affection for your charge has rendered you incapable of clear and impartial judgment. You have a father's love for the child, and that is useless to the cause. Giles refuses to leave Buffy's side, despite the fact from this point on he's no longer Buffy's official Watcher. They are told to wait for her new Watcher as Travers leaves. David Fury wrote this episode, whose efforts we last saw with Go Fish in Season 2. If I've ever seen a massive improvement, it's this episode. Giles and Buffy's relationship is tested and, call me mental, but whenever that's the case, I always love the episode. Quentin Travers is a great addition to the Watcher's Council alumni. He's neither really a hero nor a villain. Although all he wants is for Buffy to be at her best, he sacks Giles, which would more than likely do more damage than good. It really shows how far Giles has come since Season 1, where he was more stuck up and reserved compared to his more compassionate and humble nature we've seen since Season 2. Jeff Colbert, who played Zachary, would later return to the series to play a more important role in Season 6 as a different character, but here he plays a more mentally unstable vampire, something we haven't really seen before. I guess you could say all vampires are mentally unstable, but he's on pills, he's locked up. He even mentions to Joyce that he has a problem with mothers, hinting at an abusive relationship with his own. Good Monster of the Week, and an overall great episode. It's this season's Xander episode. Dan Weber returns to write his second and final episode for the show, and it's one of the most important episodes of the entire run. Despite the fact that it's essentially filler, the idea behind it and the inspiration it would go on to have towards many writers is unlike any other episode of the show. The idea was originally Joss Whedon's, although Dan Weber was the one to make it come to life, where the episode focuses on the character that matters the least to that particular episode's most important story. In this case, Xander. Oh, by the way, this episode features the best previously segment of the show. Previously on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You're fired. Xander is feeling down because he believes, compared to the rest of the gang, that his role is pointless. Buffy's a slayer, Willow's a witch, Oz is a werewolf, and Giles has the knowledge and experience to all contribute something to the fight against evil, whereas Xander's just a guy. A regular human being. A massive apocalyptic threat is about to try and open the Hellmouth, and the gang wants Xander nowhere near it to ensure his safety. Xander, feeling even more down, ends up accidentally befriending a notorious loony from the school named Jack and helps him raise his other pals from the dead. They end up breaking into a store and Xander dashes, afraid of getting into trouble. He comes across Faith who he rescues and she ends up forcing him to sleep with her, tossing him out afterwards. Xander, slightly speechless, figures out from the equipment that the loonies stole that they're planning to make a bomb. He interrogates one of the mid-drive and before his head is knocked off by a mailbox, he tells Xander that the bomb is in fact below the school in the boiler room. Xander takes on the task himself, while the rest of the gang are fighting against the worms that we saw in Prophecy Girl when the Hellmouth opens. The loonies chase Xander and two of them get killed, including Abraham from The Walking Dead, funnily enough. Xander takes on Jack solo and forces him to stop the bomb with mere seconds to go before it explodes. Jack gets killed by a wild oz who was locked in a nearby closet and the day is saved. This is undoubtedly one of the funniest episodes I've ever seen. 
It takes a completely unnecessary break from the main story, and I'm glad it does. Whenever a Xander episode is coming up, I know I'm guaranteed laughs throughout. It develops his character significantly though, and towards the end he's pretty cool, intimidating Jack so much he defuses the bomb and Xander even threatens him to never return. He is entirely capable of saving the day, however daunting the task, but it's the hilarious comparison between his small-scale bombing of the school and the full-on apocalypse that the rest of the gang are fighting, which we hardly see at all. It's genius, insanely well written, and it's one of my favourite episodes. Russell T. Davis took this as the inspiration for that episode of Doctor Who, where the Doctor's not even in it. You know the one, with Peter Kay turning it into that ridiculous slug thing. And it also inspired Joss Whedon to write Agency Shield nearly 13 years later. Back to the usual format now, when Buffy and Faith's new watcher shows up and- Oh, it's my favourite character. Wesley Wyndham Price. Buffy and Faith shrug off Wesley and run rampant around the town. The main plot is surrounding a demon named Balthazar, who's presumed to be dead but is in fact alive and seeking an amulet to restore him to normality, after a curse was put upon him, rendering him extremely obese. Buffy has decided to take an order of Faith's book and act more like her. Faith, however, is much more inexperienced than Buffy and her carefree attitude towards slaying is still going to get her into trouble. Sure enough, after getting arrested for breaking into a sports shop and escaping the crashed police car, Faith and Buffy have to fight their way out of oncoming Balthazar worshippers, which is when Faith accidentally stakes Alan, the deputy mayor, and he dies. Faith kills him and then she runs off, later hiding the body and returning home. Balthazar kidnaps Giles and Wesley, but Buffy shows up to save the day along with Angel, who she just bumped into on the way there. They save the Watchers and Buffy electrocutes Balthazar to death, who warns her in his dying moments that a power is rising and that an unknown danger will kill her. Meanwhile, the actually very known danger to the viewer, the Mayor, completes a ritual, rendering him immortal as he prepares for the evil plan ahead, which is apparently taking place 100 days from this point. Buffy goes to visit Faith, who tells her that despite the fact she killed an innocent man, she doesn't care. Ending the episode. I suppose the underlying theme here is false idols. Buffy follows Faith because she's a rule breaker. She also follows Giles because he's a rule breaker, but both in their own separate ways. However, when Wesley comes along, who does everything by the numbers to ensure the good win and the evil lose, because neither Giles nor Faith care for him, she does as they do. While Giles cares for her in a rule breaking way, at least in the eyes of the Watcher's Council, Faith doesn't care about Buffy's well-being. She doesn't care about anybody's well-being, despite the fact she killed someone. Originally, the plan was for Buffy to find Faith dead after having hung herself in her motel room, but the writers decided to further Faith's character and keep her alive. Hell, originally Wesley was supposed to be killed off after only a few short episodes too, but the writers decided to further his character as well. Let's talk about Wesley, as I've seen a lot of people in forums and the like wonder what exactly the point of his character is here. Well, look at it like this. If Faith is the anti-Buffy, who does things in a completely different way and ends up getting completely different results, Wesley is the anti-Giles, who, by the way, is infuriated by Wesley. They both try to undermine each other constantly, and all Wesley wants is the least possible conflict necessary, as evident by the scene with Balthazar. Yet Giles keeps cracking one-liners and joking about the situation, but Wesley tries to help Balthazar and give him the information he wants in order to live. We know as a viewer that Giles is doing the right thing, and what Wesley's doing is wrong, but he's just arrived. He has no idea of the setup in Sunnydale. He mentions himself that he's had hardly any first-hand experience outside of controlled circumstances circumstances with demons, and he's been trusted with two slayers. If Wesley dies, it's a disaster for the council, so he bargains to not only keep himself alive but to help the slayers. Also may I remind you that Wesley is similar in a lot of ways to Giles in the first season. Very stuffy, pompous, dorky, and by the books when it comes to being a watcher. Wesley's character helps us see how far Giles has come, and the writers probably wanted to explore that more. Continuing right from where we left off, the mayor is pretty pissed about Alan's death and plans to take it out on whoever is responsible. At the library, Wesley asks Buffy and Faith to investigate Alan's murder. Buffy and even Giles are against this idea, but Wesley puts his foot down. In comes Cordelia, and she and Wesley get off to a great start. And you teach psychology? I take psychology. She's a student. Oh, well. Buffy still can't convince Faith to confess, and Willow is pretty annoyed with Buffy for spending more time with Faith rather than her. All right, a bit full of yourself there, Willow. Mr. Trick reports to the mayor that the autopsy found that Alan's cause of death was a sharp wooden object through the heart, and this causes the mayor to cheer up exponentially, turning him onto the slayers. While Buffy and Faith sneak in Alan's office to find all of his files completely gone, Joyce is paid a visit by that same damn detective. At this point, 
I'd be a bit suspicious as to why one individual has been a prime suspect of murder three times. Both Buffy and Faith give similar, if a bit unconvincing, stories of where they supposedly were lying to the detective, of course. Buffy visits Willow and confesses as to what happened, and Willow advises her to go to Giles. She does so, but Faith has already made it there and has lied about what actually happened, telling Giles that Buffy was the one who killed the deputy mayor. Luckily, Giles is a smart guy and has caught on that Faith was lying from the get-go, and Buffy begins to tell the actual events of what happened and what they should do about it. According to Giles, this has happened before, which is quite believable that a slayer could have killed a human by accident in the past, given their line of work. Giles says the council usually handles these sorts of things, although not very well, so he decides not to inform them. However, Wesley is lurking outside, eavesdropping, and hears every word, calling up the Watcher's Council at the first opportunity. The next day, the gang attempt to decide on what they should do about Faith, and Xander finally confesses that he slept with her, and that maybe Faith would listen to him due to this connection. Buffy isn't keen on the idea, and after the conversation ends, Willow cries about it in the toilets. Is she upset it wasn't her? She has Oz! We've been down this road too many times, man! Despite Buffy's warning, Xander visits Faith anyway, and she at first looks like she's going to force herself on him, but she decides to strangle the poor bastard instead. He's saved by Angel, though, who takes Faith back to the mansion and attempts to persuade her of what's right and what's wrong, per Buffy's request. Just as it looks like he's getting through to her, Wesley shows up with a few other members of the council throwing a net over Angel and arresting Faith to take her back to London. They don't get very far as Faith escapes with ease because it's Wesley, for God's sake. Buffy finds Angel tied up and she takes him back to the library so he can update everyone on what happened and that Faith's with Wesley. Right at that moment, Wesley shows up and informs him of her escape and they head out to find her, leaving Wesley to mope in his failure. Buffy heads to the docks, assuming Faith would try to leave town, and sure enough, there she is. She tries to convince Buffy that as slayers, they're supposed to be above the law rather than obeying it. That clearly doesn't work, but before long, Mr. Trick attacks with a few other goons of his. Buffy nearly gets bit by Trick, but surprisingly, Faith saves her, dusting Mr. Trick in the process. Back in the library, Buffy updates Giles on what happened, and he suggests there may be hope for Faith yet. However, in the closing scenes of the episode, Faith visits the mayor and mentions Trick's death, and how he now has a job vacancy that she wishes to fill. Christ, that was a lot of plot. One thing that you may not have noticed about this episode, considering how much stuff actually happened, is that Oz is completely absent. This is because Seth Green was off filming his scenes in the second Austin Powers movie and needed the time off to do so. That being said, I think Marty Noxon had to fall back on the Willow and Xander romance that just won't die in order to have any heartwarming related moments at all. Mr. Trick sadly leaves us this episode and I just... I love that character. The fact that he only appears in five episodes is a crime. They kill him off to allow Faith to transfer over as the mayor's new right hand, but there's a possibility they could have easily had an arc of Mr. Trick and Faith competing to be his employee of the month or something. Maybe there wouldn't be enough time to implement that, but I hate to see him go in any way. Faith sees Buffy from the Trick at the docks, and that one action has so many layers to it. For one, Faith does have a good side to her. We saw it at the beginning of the season, and we see it here. She doesn't necessarily want to be bad, however, joining the mayor's side may indicate that there's also a level of high intelligence within her. Killing Trick allows her to make her entrance onto the mayor's side, to get revenge on Buffy and the others. Revenge for what exactly? I guess, putting her in the situation that marks a character's dramatic change of heart? Yeah, that'll do. She remains around the gang pretending as if nothing is going on for the next few episodes while colluding with the mayor. Faith is an incredibly intricate character who has deep psychological issues that are prominent in her constant changing of sides and emotions, being able to act like nothing's wrong when she literally just killed an innocent man, among other interesting actions. Now, remember when I said the wish actually served a purpose? The 50th episode of the show, oh god I've already gone through 50, and it's an absolute classic. Anya returns to this episode begging the Hoffrin, the sort of leader of the vengeance demons, for her powers back. He rejects this idea and Anya has to find a way to do it herself. She seeks help from Willow and instead of Anya's necklace being returned for some unexplained reason, the evil vampire Willow from the Wish is brought over instead. Willow freaks out upon seeing visions of the alternate reality and returns home. Meanwhile the vampire Willow goes out to the bronze, which in her reality remember was the master's lair. Not only does she beat up Percy, who Willow was instructed to tutor and was kind of a dick to her earlier in the day. She meets Buffy and Xander, who are understandably destroyed. They return to jails and they all mourn her loss right as the real Willow enters and cue one of the funniest scenes in the show. Giles planning on jumping in with an explanation anytime soon? Well, uh, something. Something, um, very strange is happening. Can you believe the Watchers Council let this guy go? On another note, Faith and the Mayor are getting along great. He even gives Faith an apartment. See, and they say politicians can be nice. Anyway, Faith informs the mayor about Willow's talent at being able to hack into things and there's a possibility she can get into the mayor's personal files. The mayor sends vampires after Willow and they of course go after the evil Willow. Evil Willow befriends the vampires, I use the term befriends loosely, and they take over the bronze. Oz and Angel are there and obviously panic. Angel heads to the library to tell the others the horrible news. Willow's dead. Hey Willow. 
They realise there's an imposter Willow out there and they head to the bronze to take her out. However, Willow lags behind, getting captured by the evil Willow who she manages to knock out and they lock her up in the library. That's me as a vampire? I'm so evil and skanky. And I think I'm kind of gay. Oh really? Well, at least that would take your mind off of Xander for a season or two. Buffy comes up with an idea to swap their costumes and the very real Willow takes over for Evil Willow at the bronze. The other vampires and Anya, who's just hanging around there for some reason, catch on pretty quickly that she's not a vampire. A human? Oh yeah, could a human do this? <coughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I so think yeah. While well, a fight breaks out over there back at the library, Cordelia finds the evil Willow locked up and she manages to convince Cordelia to let her out, given that Cordelia doesn't know she's evil. Cordelia attempts to escape Evil Willow and is saved by Wesley of all people, yeah? Evil Willow just gives up here. Just punch Wesley in the face, damn it, it's not that hard. Evil Willow goes to the bronze where the gang manages to capture her. Anya clearly clued them in on everything because in the next scene she's reluctantly helping them send the Evil Willow back to her own dimension where she immediately gets killed anyway. The next day, Willow and Buffy are sitting and talking it over when Percy approaches Willow and hands in his work for the tutoring without any issue. I included a few clips from this episode because it's just that funny. So many quotable lines and laugh out loud moments. Seriously, I could recommend this episode to almost anyone and they would find something enjoyable out of it. That's a big claim to make, I know, especially for a frankly filler episode. God, what's with season 3 making the most enjoyable episodes, the ones where almost nothing happens with the overall story? However, when you've got Joss Whedon behind the script who created these characters, you know, he's going to be the best at writing them and allowing him to direct his own jokes means that the best comedic delivery from the actors is ensured. The only real plot thing that happens is the mayor giving Faith the apartment, which could have easily been implemented in any episode, but I'm actually glad they did it here. It allows us to look at the relationship between the two, which is one of the most unique takes on the father-daughter dynamic in the show's history. That's right, father-daughter dynamic. Of course, Faith tries to thank the mayor in other ways, but he shuts her down, stating that he's a family man. Is that the vague essence of an actual decent human being inside of the season's main villain? Willow and Anya meet for the first time, and they don't get on like Willow and Anya will continue to do for the rest of their time together. Oh, and the scene where Buffy stops right she's about to take the evil Willow because the real Willow tells her not to echoes an alternate reality of what happened between Faith and Alan when Buffy told her not to stake him at the last moment. It's a testament to how reliable Buffy is as a slayer compared to Faith. She listens to everyone around her after the many times she hasn't and it's gone horribly wrong, like in When She Was Bad, for example. It's subtle, but it shows growth in her character. A demon approaches the patrolling Buffy and Faith, attempting to sell them the Books of Ascension, which he describes as being crucial to the mayor's plans. Clearly intrigued that a demon would approach the Slayers to stop a possible catastrophic situation, the gang plan to find the demon and get the books. Faith talks with the mayor first, however, and he instructs her to find and kill the demon, getting the books free of charge, which she does. The mayor also wants Angelus on his side, so Faith horribly attempts to seduce him, which fails, so the mayor finds help from a mysterious warlock who successfully takes Angel soul away and makes him evil again. If you wonder why I'm not losing my shit at the sudden bounce back to last season's plotline, just wait. Angelus agrees to joining the mayor's side and the two corner Buffy, planning to torture her. However, Faith runs her mouth and reveals that the mayor's essential will happen on graduation day, which is when Angel reveals that he was faking the whole ordeal. This causes Faith to run away, her changing of sides now very apparent to the gang. Turns out the mysterious warlock that the mayor seeked help from is an old friend of Giles who owed him a favour after Giles set him up with his wife. It's an odd episode, this one. It provides a serious story to which the resolution is completely ridiculous and played for laughs. It works somewhat, but... Not as much as if the whole episode was played for laughs rather than just the end. Had Jane Espenson written this episode, I might have been singing a different story. Uh, the scene where Faith confides an angel after killing the demon who had the books, revealing that she's scared of herself and what she can do is a bit strange, considering her character, because this idea of her being scared of herself is thrown out the window when it's revealed to be a ploy to revert Angel back to Angelus, but it's explored again later in the series, so... Is she fake in here? Or is it partly inspired by her true feelings? Angelus having a kind of false return here was an interesting choice. Obviously there was no way in hell the writers would actually bring him back as a big bad only a season later. I'm watching this after knowing it's an act that's kind of plain to see that he's faking. Angelus does things that he would never have done, such as agreeing to work for the mayor and to work alongside a slayer for any period of time. We see it from the point of view of characters who have had no personal experience with the true Angelus faith in the mayor, which is why first time viewers may be more inclined to believe it for a short amount of time. Speaking of Angelus. A point I didn't bring up in my season 2 video was the pronunciation of his name. In these earlier seasons they pronounce it as Angelus, only changing to say Angelus once Angel's own show starts up. However, 
There are a few occasions in Season 2 where they call him Angelus too. Just an odd nitpick, that's all. A little more is revealed about the mayor. On his desk it says he's Mayor Richard Wilkins III, when in reality he is also the first and second Richard Wilkins. He's posing as his own grandson, having already achieved some form of immortality up to that point. Although not quite the same level as what he achieved in Bad Girls. Cordelia returns to the gang, helping with the research of the Ascension, and now she'll stick around for the rest of the season, mainly for Wesley, who she finds dashingly attractive. She even asks him out during this episode, but we never know if he actually accepts to go to dinner with her or not. What the fuck is this episode? Seriously, what the hell did I just watch? I'm not outraged by any means, just incredibly dumbfounded and confused. We take a complete break from the main story to bring this filler episode to the forefront. However, season 3 has proved that the funniest episodes are always the one-offs, and is this episode any different? Well, yes and no. This episode has its fair share of hilarious moments and great scenes to make you laugh out loud, however, this is also the school shooting episode. Oops. Basically, Buffy inherits the ability to hear people's thoughts from some demon blood that she absorbed. It starts out great and she loves it, but it takes a turn for the worst when she can't shut it off and begins to make her go insane. She overhears someone's thoughts in the cafeteria, threatening to kill all the students, and the rest of the guy have to figure out who the culprit may be before the act takes place. While Buffy suffers in a personal hell at home, finding out that Joyce slept with Giles back in band candy after reading her thoughts, she descends into madness. Meanwhile, the gang believes that Freddy is the potential murderer who writes the school paper. It turns out that Jonathan has sent an anonymous letter to Freddy, apologising for what he's about to do. Angel finds the other demon and kills it, gaining the antidote which is located inside the demon blood also. Not exactly sure how that works, but okay. He heals Buffy and she heads to the school, stopping Jonathan just in time before he's about to shoot... himself. Yeah, turns out Jonathan wasn't the potential murderer, he was just about to blow his own brains out in the clock tower where clearly no one ever goes, judging by the state of it, and the fact it's never brought up until now. After this scene of seriousness and doing what's right, not hurting yourself or others, Buffy is teaching the younger members of the audience a lesson. Let's cut to Xander finding out that the real murderer was the lunch lady and she chases after him with a cleaver! Buffy stops her and the day is saved. See what I mean? The clashing of ideas and styles in this episode are so jarring, it doesn't help that the scene in the clock tower with Buffy and Jonathan was actually written by an uncredited Joss Whedon, meaning that the scene after with Xander and the lunch lady was written by Espenson, who we know tends to like hamming things up at the end for the sake of comedy at this current point in her writing career. I'm just gonna say it, it doesn't work. This episode, dialogue-wise, is written like any other episode of the show. It's well-paced, the characters are all hilarious, everyone gets a quip in this episode. However, the fact that they try to pull a serious message underneath all this comes across as, although well-intentioned, in poor taste. It wasn't helpful that this episode was originally meant to air a week after the Columbine shooting in April of 1999. That was just a coincidence, but, you know, that particular massacre changed things. It wasn't the episode's fault, that's something that can't be helped, but even separating it from that context in a modern world, it's still in poor taste. It reminds me of Beauty and the Beasts earlier in the season, where they decided to tackle domestic violence in an episode where Oz was jumping around as a quote, gay possum. As much as I might give this episode some criticism, one of my favourite scenes in the show is the library scene, where Buffy is listening in on everyone's thoughts. It's incredibly funny and it allows us to dive into each character's thought processes. Xander, of course, can only ever think about sex. Willow tends to doubt herself constantly. Oz thinks about existential crises in the most calm way possible. Giles always has his mind focused on the task at hand. Cordelia immediately says everything she thinks. And Wesley... Look at Cordelia. No, don't look at Cordelia. She's a student. Oh, I am bad. I'm a bad, bad man. Excuse me. I love, love, love that scene. It's fantastic and genius the way that it completely deconstructs each character by one simple thought is astounding, aside from Wesley. We won't hear from Jane Esmondson again until next season, but I admire her attempt at a serious message here. Maybe she wasn't entirely confident she could do it, so both the clock tower scene and the one in the literature class were Whedon's. However, I still think she does a fine job up until that final act. I mentioned something similar back in season 1 with Nightmares. The premise by Joss Whedon was good, even if it needed a bit of working on, but the writing and execution by David Greenwald was awful. It was a mix of writing styles and ideas that just didn't come together. This one is not a bad episode, nowhere near Nightmare levels of bad, but it's still not a masterpiece. As we approach the end of Buffy's final school year, everyone's college acceptance letters are sent out. Buffy surprisingly gets accepted into a school in Illinois, which would mean possibly leaving the Hellmouth for an extended period of time. Luckily, the University of Sunnydale, which now all of a sudden exists, was also one of the places she has been accepted, so not all hope of further education is lost. When she tells Giles and Wesley of her desires to leave Sunnydale, the two are very much against the idea, especially with the mayor planning his ascension and Faith running around like a maniac with a new fancy knife that the mayor has given her. Buffy wants to take the fight to the mayor and plan an all-out offensive, feeling the pressures of her destiny on her shoulders. The discoveries into the mayor's current dealings pay off, as one night Buffy spies on 
Faith bringing the mayor the box of Gavrock, which is key to his ascension, and he also really doesn't want it to be opened. The gang plan to break in and take the box, much to Wesley's hesitation at something possibly going wrong. They break in, steal the box, and return to the library to find that Willow has been kidnapped by Faith. Wesley points out that he mentioned something going wrong, but now that they have the box, it is crucial that they hold on to it to stop the mayor's ascension. Nobody listens as they want to save Willow, so Giles organises a trade over the phone with the mayor. Meanwhile, Willow manages to break out of the room she's being kept in thanks to some magic pencil stabbing, and she gets a good look at the books of ascension before Faith finds her. They meet at the cafeteria and the mayor has some unkind words to say about Buffy and Angel's romance, telling them that the relationship will eventually, no matter what, end in heartbreak since Angel is immortal and Buffy isn't. I mean, come, come on, what kind of a life can you offer her? I don't see a lot of Sunday picnics in the offing, see skulking in the shadows. They trade successfully until Snyder turns up with a few police officers suspecting a drug deal. The mayor ends the confusion as Snyder is taken aback, but one of the police officers is taking a peek inside the box. A beetle-like creature emerges and eats the officer's face off loose inside the cafeteria. Another escapes as the first jumps on the mayor, who quickly heals from the effects once it's thrown off by Faith, much to Snyder's shock. Buffy shuts the box and the second beetle is killed by Faith with her new fancy knife. Turns out there's apparently 50 billion beetles inside of the box, so I guess it's like the TARDIS or something? The mayor leaves and the gang return to the library, where Willow reveals she managed to rip out a few interesting looking pages of the Books of Ascension. Buffy realises the next day that she can't leave Sundale, considering that as soon as the mayor is dealt with, there will more than likely be another danger around the corner. Well, four more, going by the number of seasons left. Willow, who has been accepted into almost every college in the world, decides to keep her friend company as they both decide to enrolled at the University of Sunnydale. One thing I didn't bring up in this synopsis is Cordelia, who is here, don't get me wrong, but the arc they're setting up here is in its very early stages as she's revealed to the viewer to be working in a local clothes store. Now, this is rich girl Cordelia, who seemingly can't even afford to buy the prom dress she wants. She always gets found out by Xander, but more will be revealed soon. Wesley's role in this episode furthers my earlier point about him doing everything by the books. He knows that taking the fight to the mayor is a good idea, but he's very much aware of the risks and warns the gang. However, when, shockingly, it doesn't go exactly as planned, he's proved to be right. As soon as they're a step ahead of the mayor, he wants to secure the box, but the gang wants to save Willow. Saving Willow is what we want the gang to do also, but Wesley's point of one life for possibly thousands is fair and very valid. It's a shame he goes about explaining that in the worst way possible. Maybe he'd actually be respected by the gang. The mayor's confrontation and mocking of Buffy and Angel is an important turn for their relationship, as by the end of the episode they try to shrug off the doubts that were already sent to their heads earlier, but just can't seem to do so. Aside from that, Xander mentions that he plans to go travelling instead of enrolling at a college, more likely because he didn't get accepted into any rather than just personal preference. A strong episode. It's more of an arc starter rather than continuing any other previous arcs. It's the beginning of the final act of the season, so let's see what happens next, shall we? Marty Noxon's final contribution to season 3, and we're edging ever so near to that finale. First we need to get past the prom night, which Buffy is looking very forward to. Angel is hesitant after the doubts he's been having lately, and after a visit from Joyce, he decides that breaking up with Buffy and leaving town would be the ideal outcome in order to not steal Buffy's life away from her. You know, considering having kids or, or having sex in general is off the table. Good luck to the both of you. He's pushed to actually do the deed by a nightmare he has of Buffy and himself getting married before she suddenly gets burned to a crisp instead of him. I'm not sure exactly what the symbolism is there. He's, he's burning her heart with the romance. Check the comments or something, I don't know. While Angel and Buffy are hunting a vampire, which we never see in the sewers, the topic of the prom is brought up and Angel picks that point to break up with her, not after the prom, so that Buffy can have a happy time, but right before it. Can I say, however, the hilltop scene in Amends ain't got nothing on this. This is believably acted and well written. I know it's meant to be heartbreaking, but I revel in these turning points. This scene has a knock-on effect for the rest of the show. Scratch that. Both shows. This single act is probably the longest felt in the entire franchise. Angel plans to leave after the ascension is over and Faith is dealt with. Where to? He doesn't know yet, but that's enough for Buffy to call up Willow and have a good old fashioned cry while Willow sits there, unsure of what to do. Meanwhile, Xander catches Cordelia inside the fashion store again, where he finds out that Cordelia's father has been charged for tax fraud and they've lost all their money and belongings. She can't go to any colleges she's been accepted to or even afford her prom dress, which is the main reason why she's working there. Right at that moment, a dog looking demon jumps through the window and attacks a guy in a tuxedo, leaving everyone else. Somehow Cordelia and Xander manage to get the CCTV footage, I assume they stole it, and the gang are watching it in the library. When Cordelia gets questioned about why she was there, Xander actually covers for her and says she was just shopping. In the footage, a mysterious figure is spotted controlling from outside the store. Tucker Wells, who is pissed at being rejected to go to the prom, decides he will get his revenge by attacking the prom with some demon dog hellhound things. I don't know how he got them. They hint at magic, but that's too much of a cop-out for me. 
I'll say Tucker's a keen breeder in his spare time, although these are like part human. So moving on, he's been showing them prom movies to get them to attack people only in tuxedos because we don't want needless deaths, of course. Buffy gets an address for Tucker at a local butcher's where he's been ordering cow brains for the Hellhounds, and she conveniently runs into Angel, who offers his help with the Hellhounds, but Buffy shuts him down too right, fuck you Angel, even though you're doing the right thing. Buffy finds Tucker at his place where he reveals that three of the Hellhounds have already been released and are on their way to the school right now. Smash cut to the prom where Buffy has somehow made it before the Hellhounds and God knows what happened to Tucker. Anyway, she stops him briefly and pretty swiftly and joins the celebrations at the prom. Cordelia shows up in the dress she wanted because Xander actually bought it for her. Wesley pretty much stiffens on the spot and the two dance, meeting Xander who's been lectured by Anya who's just here again about the many men she's killed in the past. Soon enough it's time for the prize giving and Jonathan appears announcing that Buffy's efforts as the Slayer have not gone unnoticed by the rest of the school year and they offer her an umbrella as a reward, dubbing her the class protector. An umbrella I guess because it might rain? The prop department was probably having a nightmare that day and sent someone to the dollar store. I guess it's the thought that counts and for what it's worth Buffy is taken aback and very grateful. Not as taken aback and grateful when Angel shows up, dressed in a tuxedo and the two dance to a pretty nice cover of Wild Horses. Sarah Michelle Geller listed this as her favourite episode of the show, mainly for the Buffy and Angel stuff I would assume, because it's by far the highlight here. I like demon dogs and all, but when we have actual character development, I mean that's some good shit, I'll take that over demon dogs any day. To be honest, I think the Tucker plotline was kinda shoehorned in and not really ever concluded. Tucker just gets left at his place, with another hellhound still there by the way, that's really playing it safe Buffy, just leave them be. The prize giving scene is great, a favourite of mine, I know I took the piss out of it a bit, but it is a great conclusion to the high school years of the show. On the contrary to what Giles said all the way back in the second episode of the show, about how people usually block out what they can't comprehend, which was just the show's way of establishing very early on why no one else was that bothered by the fact that we're demons, I mean this proves otherwise. They don't talk about it, but they're very much aware she's been stopping the end of the world, and are grateful. Now, take your dollar store umbrella and be fucking happy. Happy Buffy. Well, if the prom was the camp before the storm, here's the goddamn storm. We'll be doing the second to last day of the school year at Sunnydale High, and also only a day until the mayor's ascension. The gang discover that the mayor will be a guest speaker at the graduation ceremony, and they put two and two together that he's going to try and kill all the students as his opening act, so to speak. Faith visits a professor who is responsible for discovering the demon that the mayor plans to take the form of after the ascension and she kills him, tying up any loose ends. Buffy, Giles and Wesley read about it in the paper the next day and realise Faith was behind it. Xander meets Anya in class and when he mentions the ascension he discovers that Anya had actually witnessed an ascension during her demon days. He takes her to the guy and she informs him that the ascension makes the ascended pure demon. Yep, as it turns out, every demon or vampire that Buffy has fought thus far has been half demon because they're all tainted by some form of humanity. This is an odd revelation and I'll go into why more in the future, but it it doesn't make the most sense in the grand scheme of things. Anyway, the mayor shows up to the library and threatens them all, including Buffy. Giles plunges a sword into him, which he shrugs off because he's immortal and all, and he swiftly leaves. While Anya fails to convince Xander to leave with her, trying to tell him that he'll only get in the way, which he knows is bullshit after the Zeppo, and Buffy succeeds in convincing a hesitant Joyce to leave Sunnydale, Oz and Willow have a good old fashioned sex session. This one doesn't end like Buffy and Angel's sex session, though as they're actually happy about it afterwards. Buffy goes to the dead professor's apartment and finds a box of documents that may be handy in stopping the ascension. Angel shows up rather sloppily and as the two get into a heated argument outside about Angel's decision to leave, Faith shoots him with an arrow and narrowly missing his heart. Deliberately. Angel collapses into Buffy's arms and she takes him back to the library. Wesley and Giles discover through the box of documents that the mayor can be killed after the ascension and that whatever demon form he takes is not immortal. Angel isn't recovering at all, meaning that he's been poisoned by the arrow and Wesley offers to ask the council for assistance. He returns later to tell Buffy that the councillor outright refusing to help, as it has nothing to do with the mayor or the ascension. Buffy and Turn refuses to be affiliated with the council anymore and tells Wesley to get fucked. Willow finds out what the poison is and that the only way for it to be cured is by drinking the blood of a slayer, conveniently. Buffy sets out after Faith to heal Angel with her blood, with Faith's old knife in hand. She arrives at the apartment after Willow discovers the location of it and the two confront each other. Faith informs Buffy that the poison was her idea and Buffy attacks her, beginning a brawl. While the mayor is busy snacking on some of those beetles we saw in the box of Gavrock, he's informed about Faith being in trouble. Buffy and Faith's fight continues outside on the balcony where Buffy manages to handcuff the two together to avoid Faith fleeing. It doesn't last long and Faith breaks the chain holding them together. Buffy responds by stabbing Faith in the stomach, to which they're both quite taken aback. Faith, in a final act of stopping Buffy from saving Angel, dives off of the balcony, falling into the back of a passing truck, where she's taken away from Buffy's grasp. Buffy quickly flees as the mayor shows up and feels sad. Willow and Oz, who are looking after the delirious Angel, are sent away by Buffy to help with the rest of the gang's last minute research, and Buffy forces Angel to drink from her, not caring about the possible repercussions that having no slayer the most important battle in, well, perhaps human history he could have. Angel rushes the unconscious Buffy to the hospital where they tell him that it's more than likely she'll live, which is incredibly lucky the 
the angel had any control over how much he could drink from her without killing her. The mayor is in the next room, however, with a comatose faith lying in the bed in front of him. The doctor informs him that she will more than likely never wake up again. Ha ha. Yeah, right. Anyway, the mayor overhears the doctors talking about Buffy and he attempts to suffocate her, but is swiftly stopped by Angel. The gang soon arrive after the mayor's departure, and while there's a sense of relief that Angel is okay, they, especially Giles, are not particularly happy that Angel drank from Buffy, unaware that it was Buffy's decision. Buffy has a dream in which she's talking to Faith, where she tells Buffy that the mayor's weakness is his humanity, and the weaknesses that the human mind just has. Buffy wakes, and after kissing Faith for a coma brand of assistance, prepares the gang for war. Back at the library... That's, that's the last time I get to say that, huh? The gang decide that the most likely weakness of the mayor's mind is faith and his memory and affection toward her. Wesley returns and asks if he can help on his own accord with the battle, to which the gang accepts. Buffy comes up with a plan, which the viewer isn't completely clued in on until it happens, but Angel and Zadar are sent after explosives, which is Jill's responsibility to set off. And Willow and Oz are sent to gather as much help from the rest of the school year as they can get. Meanwhile, Cordelia and Wesley finally kiss, and it goes about as well as you think it would. Cordelia pushes Wesley away, friendly, and decides she's not into whatever the hell technique that is, mate. Angel tells Buffy that once the fight is over, they won't say goodbye, but instead just leave to avoid any temptation to stay or continue to let the flame light in their forbidden romance. The graduation ceremony soon begins, and as the mayor starts his incredible long speech much to the gang's annoyance, the once in a hundred years eclipse begins starting the ascension. The mayor transforms into the demon Olvacan, which is a giant snake, and the entire school year begins their assault. Both Larry and Principal Snyder are part of the early casualties, as Angel's team joins the assault joined by Wesley, and they begin to attack the vampires which the mayor has helping him. Wesley is knocked out after one hit and lies on the deck for the duration of the fight, but Angel is up and about, just as a flock of students rush away falling back on Buffy's orders. During this, Harmony is killed by a vampire as well as a few other students. Buffy, now alone in front of the snake, Mayor taunts him with Faith's knife and runs off, somehow outrunning the massive snake and leads him to the library where the many explosives are situated. Buffy leaps out of the window of the library, finding Giles who detonates the explosives Wily Coyote style and kills the snake mayor as the rest of the surviving class watch on. In the aftermath, Wesley is taken away on a stretcher as Buffy and Xander talk about the fight. He lets her know that Angel survived, but assumes that he took off afterwards. Giles approaches and hands Buffy her slightly burnt high school diploma, which he managed to find in the rubble, and congratulates her on saving the world yet again. Buffy looks around at her surroundings and spots Angel in the distance, watching her. As the two share eye contact, he turns and departs, heading to God knows where. The guy look at the wrecked Sunnydale High and take a moment to acknowledge the painful memories they've had there, walking off as the season draws to a close. I love this finale, it's superb. First off, the final battle scene at the graduation ceremony is expertly shot, although the obviously CGI'd Snake Mare is a bit of an eyesore, especially nowadays. It's a thrilling conclusion to this chapter of the show, and if you can believe it, was so violent, I say violent with quotation marks here because all it shows is weapons, and that was enough for the WB to pull the episode only a few hours before it was due to air because of the possible implications towards Columbine. Again. Earshot was understandable, but this just doesn't make me think of that at all. So, believe it or not, the first part was aired in May, and the second two months later in July. It caused outrage at the time because it was shown everywhere else in the world, so for a few short weeks, bootlegs were rampant among hardcore fans who wanted the conclusion they were due. The explosion they set off to kill the mayor wasn't computer generated, obviously. It was a real explosion that was filmed at 5am in Torrance, California. It woke up multiple residents and destroyed a few windows of nearby houses and cars. The town refused to allow Buffy to be filmed there again, which was fine considering that only the highest school scenes were shot there, and since it was blown up in the canon of the show, there was no need to film there again. It reminds me of a throwaway line in The Harvest back in season one, where Willow suggests blowing up the school in order to get them kicked out. Anyway, the mayor leaves us this episode considering he's a snake, and dead. One of my favourite villains of the show. Although not my absolute favourite, that honour still goes to Angelus in season two, but the mayor is a more comedic adversary to Buffy and the gang. Harry Groner's performance is undoubtedly one of the most memorable of the show's run, and he always has me smiling when he gets his screen time. It's also a plus he doesn't kill an established character in his first episode, so he's more likeable to Angelus on that point. Some things that occur here are, I'll admit, very coincidental, most notably the poison that Faith uses on Angel and its cure of the Slayer's blood. It's revealed later on that you have to be a potential Slayer in order to become a Slayer, so what's the difference between the blood of a potential and a normal Slayer? Does the contents of a Slayer's blood change when they become the actual Slayer? Does that hurt? I'm getting ahead of myself here, but it doesn't take away from the overall story. An hour and a half of pure action adventure and storytelling joy. Brilliant.
Season 3 of Buffy the Vampire Slayer has quite the progression from its first episode all the way to its finale. It gets off to a rocky start with a few not bad episodes but certain decisions and arcs that don't particularly work in my opinion compared to if they tried them during season 2 or even season 1. The contrast between both Faith and Buffy is some of the best exploration the writers ever did. Not only do we see how they work side by side but also as enemies. They both have their father figures too jealous for Buffy and the mirror for Faith. Watching those two relationships develop alongside each other is fascinating because one is built on doing good, while the other is built on killing and destroying the world. Giles is the caring and kind soul we've seen since his drastic transformation during season 2. Long since moved on from Jenny, he cares solely for Buffy now and since he's been let go from the council, he doesn't do this for the money anymore but rather for the sake of doing what's right. Willow has grown into a pretty moderate level witch in her relationship with Oz, although Rocky around the middle of the season is all peachy by the end. My only complaint here is that Oz doesn't have much development, he's the same at the beginning as he is by the end. I mean we don't even have an Oz-centric episode this season, I guess. Beauty and the Beast is the closest we get, but that has other focuses to worry about, so Oz is almost sidelined again. He will get more development in the next season, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Xander is now more confident in his behaviour and capability in the gang. He's the human aspect to Buffy's gang. With no real knowledge of demons or magic powers, he's just a guy. Anya seems to be taking a shine to him after their dance in the prom, so we'll get to see that developed and expanded upon a bit more next time too. Cordelia departs from the gang here with no real ties to any members of it, and she heads off to Los Angeles, where we'll meet up with her in the future. I'd argue that all they did this season with her was revert her back to how she was before Xander, mitigating all that development we'd seen over season 2. However, it all serves a purpose. Speaking of that purpose, Angel also leaves us this season, heading on a quest to discover more about his purpose and the mysterious powers that be. Here it does seem like they didn't really know what to do with him a lot, considering he was meant to stay dead and all, and watching himself and Buffy sort of prance around for a little while with nothing really happening was frustrating on a repeating view but not really noticeable to the casual viewer. He does just sort of sit around for almost the whole season though and only really having anything to do with the overarching story towards the end. The most development he'll get is obviously on his own show which we'll be taking a look at next time as well as the next season of Buffy considering they both run alongside each other. On the matter of Buffy, she's definitely grown since the start of the season where she was desperately trying to run away whenever something wasn't going her way and she's learned from that. Buffy is now a strong and capable Slayer. She's now the only Slayer again considering Faith's coma, which we know she'll come back from. I mean, come on, it looks hopeless. She'll never wake up. Sounds to me like she's gonna wake up. I still cite this as my favourite season, despite its questionable start. It kept me chuckling and captivated almost the whole time. My favourite episode this season would have to be the Zeppo. Season 3 put a lot of focus on its individual stories this time as opposed to season 2, which treated filler as just that filler. Despite the fact that Zeppo serves no purpose to season 3's story, it gives Xander the limelight, which he almost never gets. My least favourite is absolutely no surprise. Dead Man's Party. It feels wrong the whole way through, its conflict is proven unnecessary by sheer logic. It's a relief to know that the worst episode of the show is behind us now. It is behind us now, right? There, there can't be a worse episode than that. Well, I, I guess we'll find out next time when we look at season 4 of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, a season that I have an awful lot to say about. Oh yeah, that's going to be a big one. Oh, Umbrella! As in, like, she's protecting the class. She's the umbrella to the demon downpour of the... Oh, okay, I get it now. Thanks for watching, everyone, and apologies for how long this took. I wasn't prepared for this video to be as long as it was, and I'll try to be a bit better about that in the future, but there was so much I wanted to cover here. I'm working on two videos at the same time now, with both Buffy and Angel now going on at the same time. It may take a while, but I don't want to leave it as long as this one took, which was nearly two months, which is abysmal in terms of time management. For your patience, I'm grateful, and if you want to see more content like this in the future, be sure to hit the subscribe button as it's a great way to keep track of my current motivation. Aside from that, I'll see you all when I see you.